Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, guys, for, for getting me set up here. My name is Gino Galabio. I'm a uh, research officer with the uh, National Institute for Nanotechnology uh, here uh, on the U of A campus, and I'm also a, uh, an adjunct uh, of the Department of Physics uh, here at the U of A. Uh, I realize after today I'm going to have to check with my agent to see what kind of gigs she schedules for me. <laughs> we'll be better next time. Um, okay, I'm, I was asked to uh, come and speak about um, some of the work that I do with, uh, with um, uh, Westgrid uh, computational facilities. I'm, uh, for the most part, a Gaussian user. A lot of the uh, development work that I do uh, relates to uh, using Gaussian as a tool, but also using uh, taking the, the tools that I develop with Gaussian and using them in Gaussian. Uh, for the most part, the HPC aspect that I take advantage of is the large number of cycles that are available to me uh, for the work that I'm going to show you. And then in, uh, of late, the, uh, over the last couple of years, the bulk of the work that I've been doing with Westgrid uh, facilities uh, relates to the development of um, uh, methods that are able to accurately predict non-covalent interactions using a uh, computational technique called density functional theory. Uh, so I hope everyone is familiar, at least to some extent, or on the user level, with what density functional theory is, because I don't have any real uh, introduction on that. Uh, but I do have a bit of introduction uh, on, on um, non-covalent interactions in general. So if you could advance to the next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture of a uh, of the foot of a gecko, and geckos, um, at least according to this uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper, use Van der Waals forces to uh, allow them to climb up on uh, walls and ceilings of the uh, hotel room at your Mexican resort. Uh, these are. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with them, non, uh, excuse me, Van der Waals interactions are, are non-covalent interactions. These are non-bonding forces that exist between molecules. And the uh, gecko uses, uh, uses that uh, chemical force uh, to adhere to uh, walls and ceilings. It's really quite phenomenal. If you go to the next slide, please, what you'll see is uh, the uh, one of the procedures used for, next slide. Right. Uh, one of the procedures used for actually measuring the, uh, the force of adhesion between the foot of a gecko and uh, and a standardized piece of, uh, I think, believe this is gallium arsenide, polished gallium arsenide, and a little quotation uh, taken from the paper. So, um, this is this paper was so neat because it, it really did provide the first direct experimental evidence for the use of non-covalent interactions on a macroscopic level uh, by something that we can we can identify with. Of course, non-covalent interactions are broadly important. In, in particular, we wouldn't function as biological entities without uh, the operation of non-covalent interactions. Uh, protein structure, for example, is uh, determined to a large extent by non-covalent interactions between the different parts of a protein. So, uh, as many of you know, proteins are biological machines that have a function in the body. They might catalyze a reaction. Uh, as, as enzymes, or, or they may produce uh, chemicals that are uh, required for our bodies. And the structure of proteins determine their function. And so without these non-covalent interactions that shape proteins in, into a particular uh, form, they wouldn't function as they're supposed to. We wouldn't exist as, as we do. So, um, we don't do much work with proteins, but we do care about non-covalent interactions. If you'll just click again, please. Uh, we, we have spent the last couple of years uh, using uh, density functional theory methods to model uh, processes related to the formation of three-dimensional organic lines on silicon. And the idea here is to combine uh, functionality of organic species with uh, ubiquitous silicon technology uh, with 
the, the grand goal of developing a molecular Etch-a-Sketch where we could draw uh, circuits of organic molecules on silicon and utilize those in real functional devices. Uh, next slide, please. We also, uh, and, and again, so there's going to be a lot of clicking uh, through here. We, we've also, you can't, you know, murder without doing work in, in the oil sands. And we've been modeling uh, recently um, structures related to asphaltinic materials that appear in oil sands ditch. Asphaltines are the bad things that are in, or some of the bad things that are in bitumen that prevents efficient upgrading of bitumen to usable petroleum products. And so we've been using uh, our techniques to understand uh, the, the nature of these structures, how strongly they bind as a result of non-covalent interactions, uh, and what can be done to, to mitigate some of the We've also done some work with organic electronic materials. Uh, a click again will show you uh, these are polythiophene. This is a polythiophene dimer. Uh, polythiophene is one of the um, polymer materials that are used to build flexible organic solar cells and other flexible organic electronic devices like thin film transistors. Uh, and so we've, we've done a bit of work around uh, trying to understand what those interactions are. So how do we model these systems? Well, um, we're interested in processes that, uh, uh, processes where bonds are made and broken and electrons are transferred around. And that means we need to use an electronic structure theory method, uh, like density functional theory. And because we're looking at large systems, density functional theory is really the only option that we have. And that is because it's fairly computationally efficient uh, as far as electronic structure uh, theory methodology is concerned, far more efficient than wave function theory methods. Um, and we like uh, we like D3LYP. It's a fairly it's fairly long in the tooth now, but it's it's well proven. And, and one of the best things about D3LYP as a density functional theory method uh, is that its pitfalls uh, tend to be fairly well known. It's been around the block a few times. People have test driven it. They know where the problems are. They know uh, how well it works in many cases. And, and for the most part, it works quite well for for uh, chemistry. So one of the main problems with D3LYP is a density functional theory method is that it cannot accurately predict non covalent interactions. It cannot, it cannot do it. Uh, some people will tell you that D3LYP is fairly reliable for uh, or the strongest of the non-covalent interactions, like hydrogen bonding. Uh, but in fact, that's not if you dig, if you dig in and, and, and really put it through its paces, you'll find that even with hydrogen bonding, there are other issues. Uh, so we undertook many years ago to try to solve this problem before uh, dispersion uh, corrected density functional techniques were widely available uh, in the Gaussian program and in other programs. Now they are, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. But uh, first, I'm going to tell you uh, really uh, just how bad conventional density functional theory methods are for weak interactions. And so as I said, we, we started looking at this a long time ago. Uh, click again, please, and you'll see uh, a test that we did on a, a bunch of molecules, or sorry, dimers of molecules. These dimers are interacting uh, non-covalently. The nature of the interaction depends on the nature of the monomer species that are involved in this dimerization. So some of the interactions are uh, can be characterized as dispersion, and this is the weakest of all of the non-covalent interactions, the uh, uh, induced dipole, induced dipole kind of interactions. Very, very weak. They tend to be measured in Kelvins, uh, uh, gives you a sense of how weak they are. Uh, some some of the interactions uh, in our in our little test set here are, are dipole induced dipole interactions. They tend to be the next strongest, but still fairly weak. Uh, and then dipole dipole interactions and, and hydrogen bonded interactions. So this set of 20, 20 or twenty five uh, dimers was used in our um, original assessment of how density functional theory methods do uh, in in conventional density functional methods do in uh, predicting non covalent interactions. So the next slide will show that gives you a sense of just how bad these methodologies are. So the plot here is showing you percent error in the calculated binding energy versus the nature of the interaction, roughly 
roughly categorized for a number of different density functional theory methods with our favorite B3LYP on the top. And so you can see that from this plot that B3LYP, without any corrections for dispersion or other weak interactions, gives an error in uh, predicted dispersion binding on the order of 100%. Now that, uh, that number is actually not correct. The, the, the real error is much higher. What we did was we assigned anything uh, that was uh, unbound that had no binding in it whatsoever. We just arbitrarily assigned it a 100% um, uh, error of binding energy. But actually, for the dispersion down uh, dimer species, when we hold them in there uh, in, in, in the structure that they should have, if the method were able to predict the interactions properly, uh, B3LYP predicts them to be rather repulsive. And so that error should really be about 200%. But you can see these other methods, um, uh, PDE, P971, these are other density functional theory methods. They're not as bad, but, but they're really not uh, performing acceptably. And MP2, which is the most affordable wave function theory method and often used in benchmarks for uh, non-covalent interactions, actually performs fairly, fairly poorly for dispersion interactions as well. And in all cases, the strength of the, or the quality of the predictions improve as the strength of the interactions increase. Uh, but again, um, the, the uh, performance is not that great. And even the 5% or so that's predicted by all the methods for hydrogen bonding, uh, that error is a lot larger when you start to look at a broader uh, set of hydrogen uh, band systems. OK, uh, next slide. So in, in terms of improving the performance of density functional theory methods, um, a number of approaches have been developed and incorporated into the Gaussian program. Uh, I've highlighted uh, uh, two of the most commonly used methods uh, in the first two bullet points here. The, the first is the, the so-called DFTD or DFTD3 approach uh, that's been popularized by Grimma. Uh, actually, the, the uh, fundamental approach was developed uh, many decades ago um, and, and uh, really in, it was in about 2004 that, that Grimma started working on it and not until of course it got into Gaussian that it became very popular. Uh, but that works fairly well um, and, and is, is broadly available now for uh, a number of different density functional theory methods. So if you go into Gaussian, I'll show you a sample input for this. Uh, later, you can call on a functional that, that has uh, these dispersion corrections associated with them and, and use this methodology for simulation. Another popular approach is the M062X approach that uh, is developed by Truelize Group. This is a bit of a different uh, approach. So where the, where the DFTD, uh, DFTD approach uses um, atom-centered empirical terms to correct the energy of the that's predicted by the density functional. The MO6 is a uh, kind of a revised uh, DFT method with a large number of parameters, and those parameters have been tuned to reproduce dispersion and other non-covalent binding uh, properties, as well as thermochemical properties and chemical properties. So it's sort of a more holistic approach. Uh, our approach is, is different from the other two. It's not implemented directly in Gaussian, but implementable in Gaussian because our approach utilizes a application. Gaussian is a way of dispersion fraction. And this approach is, is uh, uh, takes advantage of some machinery that's been around in the uh, computational chemistry, uh, right, computational chemistry uh, tools for many decades now. It's based on effective core potential technology. And I'll tell you a little bit about it. A couple of reviews were uh, that uh, on, on ECPs and also other dispersion corrective methods. One that we published in 2009, and we're presently completing a chapter for reviews in computational chemistry that should be available, uh, or at least submitted next month as well. And the dispersion correcting, sorry, <laughs> dispersion correcting potential work uh, is what uh, we have uh, and it, we, we benefited from uh, Q Canada uh, resource allocation uh, support uh, to, for, for our development. Okay, now next slide, please. Great. Okay, so it, 
if you want to use uh, dispersion corrected density functional theory methods with the Gauss GIMP program, uh, here's an example of how you might uh, call on the, uh, the D3 approach. So as I said, D3 uh, parameters are available for a large number of density functionals. So uh, here I'm showing you uh, a sample input file for the water dimer, uh, calling on the LYP density functional. Uh, but you could you could as easily call on the PDE functional or any of your uh, favorite functional. And the uh, the corrections for dispersion are incorporated using this key guessing keyword empirical dispersion equals PD that's Grimma D3 refers to the Becca Johnson uh, cutoff function that's associated with these experiments. If you use the default uh, cutoff function uh, that Grimma uh, published, uh, you'll find that your results are not quite as good. Okay, uh, click again, please. Oops, I think something was missing. Oh. Okay, looks like we lost something on the last slide, but that's it. Uh, so click one back, please. Um, uh, so I, I didn't, actually maybe we can go back one more, I'll just add, say this, uh, if you wanted to use the M062X functional, you could replace the B3 LYP in this input file with, with the letters and numbers M062X with no dash, and delete empirical dispersion equals D3, uh, GD3J, and you would be running an M062X calculation. So otherwise, you can put the same. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, nope, back. Okay, so uh, uh, here's how uh, you incorporate uh, our dispersion correcting potentials into a Gaussian um, input file. It's the same structure as the, the previous input files that I showed you, the, the, the one uh, in, uh, incorporating the Grimma dispersion. Again, the keyword here is B3LYP. Uh, and the uh, structure for the water dimer, the Cartesian coordinates for the water dimer are given with the basis set uh, description below. Uh, but then there's this add-on to the input file. If you click again, you'll see it. The text is blue. And this is the DCP input. So there's a, there's a, uh, there's a fair bit of input uh, here as compared to just a conventional, very simple uh, Gaussian input uh, file. Uh, but it, it uh, takes very little efforts uh, to incorporate these. You can cut them and paste them into an input file from, from a variety of sources. Uh, and the only other addition that's required is the inclusion of the keyword pseudo equals read. Right? Uh, that's in, in blue on the first line of the input file. Uh, so if you click again, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we recognize when we're developing these is that um, people are just not going to want to cut and paste uh, stuff out of a paper into, uh, uh, into an input file. So we have a Gaussian uh, input generator utility available on this website here. So you're welcome to, to check it out. Uh, and you can get, send your comments to me. Uh, uh, these uh, dispersion correcting potentials work. Well, um, it really is based, as I said, on very decades old technology. Uh, back in the back in the days when uh, when your average supercomputer was less powerful than your iPhone, uh, people had to be very careful with the amount of resources they could allocate to the calculation of uh, to doing computational chemistry calculations. Even to the extent where it was highly economical to throw away uh, a bunch of electrons in, in your system if you could and replace them with the simple potential. So. In effective core potential technology, for example, where we have uh, iodine with a lot of electrons, um, well, you can throw away most of the electrons in iodine uh, because the chemistry of iodine is controlled by the valence electrons. So instead of representing the 1s, 2s, 2p, etc., cetera, uh, core orbitals, you can replace them with an effective core potential. And a potential of a simple form, the form shown just above, is gas. Uh, and the valence electrons would maintain their behavior because they would see an effective potential that looked a lot like the potential associated with these core electrons. Well, we're doing the same thing with dispersion correcting potentials, which is why we can utilize that, that same uh, approach uh, in our input files. 
Uh, except in our case, the potentials that we're introducing don't replace any core electrons. They, they're constructed in such a way so as to tune the electronic environment in which all of the electrons move. And thereby, uh, we can re reproduce the correct behavior in many of the density functions. Theory methods that we use. Next slide. Please. Okay, so how do we generate these? Again, this is uh, this is, uh, we benefited uh, uh, really significantly from our uh, our uh, resource allocation grant from uh, UQ Canada. Uh, so on, here on the left side of the slide, I'm showing you uh, the, the uh, DCT Gaussian input file with the DCT functions highlighted. Loop, and uh, in the middle, I'm showing you the, uh, the Gaussian type function that describes each of those um, dispersion correcting potentials. So, zooming in on just the dispersion correcting potentials associated with the hydrogen atom, uh, the structure uh, is revealed with, I think, three more clicks. So the, the, the numbers in the blue box correspond to the coefficients of the, uh, the uh, dispersion correcting potential functions. Another click. Uh, the numbers in the green box correspond to the exponents of that Gaussian function. And then one more click. Uh, those twos in the red boxes correspond to the power of uh, R uh, associated with that uh, portion. So when we're when we're doing uh, when we're developing these uh, um, dispersion correcting potentials, we're essentially optimizing uh, those those pieces of these uh, Gaussian type functions. In fact, we don't really we don't do any optimization with the numbers in the red box. Those are those powers of R are usually chosen uh, a priori after fix. Uh, you know, of course, um, for partly historical but other technical reasons. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. Uh, here's how, here's how uh, dispersion correcting potentials are generated. Uh, we start with an initial guess for our uh, dispersion correcting potentials. And as, as you probably gathered from the Gaussian input file, uh, DCPs require uh, input for each atom. And as you probably also gathered from that input file, the DCPs are specific uh, not only to the atoms, but also to the uh, density functional theory method chosen and to the basis set uh, that's used as well. It turns out that DCPs are not that sensitive to basis set. And if you optimize uh, DCPs for, say, a mid-sized basis set, uh, that it tends to work fairly well for all ranges of basis sets. OK, so we start out with some initial gas, and that could be previous, previously optimized uh, or different function out or, or uh, even just uh, randomly entered numbers. Uh, and then we select a, uh, in, in, in the next step, we select uh, the, the data to which the DCPs would be optimized. So we're interested primarily in non-covalent interactions. So we have a set of, of uh, non-covalent uh, uh, data, binding energies for dimers and trimers and different configurations. Uh, and we use, and we we calculated, uh, or we've extracted from the literature, uh, highly reliable binding energies for those systems. And we use that to fit our DCPs. Okay, and then we submit our op optimization scripts on Grex. We're using Grex exclusively because that's where the Westgrid uh, Gaussian license is. And uh, the script uh, goes through a number of steps. It starts by building the Gaussian input files based on the information that we have in steps one and two. So we decided on our atom, we've decided uh, on our method and basis set, and the data to which we're going to fit, and the script will build a Gaussian input file with all that information. Then it builds Q files uh, for submission uh, of the Gaussian jobs themselves, uh, submits those Q files to the Q on Grex, and then monitors the status of those, uh, of those jobs. Uh, as they're running. So I think it checks for completion every uh, 15 seconds, something like that. Some of these jobs really only take about 10 seconds to complete. Um, so that's a that's one of the challenges that we're facing in terms of using graphs for this work. 
once all of the jobs are completed, so this is this is yet another issue, we do require that all of the calculations associated with the particular step in a, in a, uh, in a DCP optimization, all of those steps, all of those runs need to be completed before the next step in the function optimization can proceed. So the script then extracts the energy of all the non-covalently bonded systems in our, in our fitting set. Uh, and then computes their binding energy, uh, weighs that against the, uh, the, the high level or the accepted binding energies, and then adjusts the coefficients and exponents of the DCP functions um, until, until some sort of uh, um, suitable level is, is achieved. So that's step four. We were, or, sorry, that cycle continues until we reach some suitable level, and then we go on to the next atom. So let me let me just go through this uh, very quickly again with, with one worked example. I, I showed you the water uh, dimer in previous examples. We would need to, uh, first of all, optimize DCP functions for the hydrogen atom. Then we would take those op optimized functions uh, and put them into the calculation, and then optimize um, uh, DCP functions for the oxygen atom. And we might iterate a few times uh, until some sort of self-consistency is achieved. So that's how we would develop uh, general uh, DCPs for hydrogen. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, um, so let me tell you a little bit about some of the success that we've had with, with DCPs. We published a paper in, in 2012 that talked about um, uh, really an unprecedented level of improvement in the performance of D3LYP for non-covalent interactions through the use of uh, DCPs. And um, it, it, uh, the, part, of the, part of the element of success that we had here is the fact that we were able to do uh, really very good modeling of non-covalently bonded systems with a, with a fairly small basis set. A lot of the techniques that are talked about in the literature could use very, very large basis sets, which means calculations take a long time. Uh, this basis set that we're fond of, the 631 plus G2D2P, is a, is a uh, fairly good mid-sized basis set that, that tends to do quite well for, uh, for not just uh, our non-covalent interactions, but thermochemistry as well. So this series of plots shows you the, uh, gives you some uh, notion of how uh, B3LIT BCP methodology performs relative to M06 2X. I threw another functional in here, omega B97 XD, which is uh, used. Uh, I seem to be missing the D3, but we do we do much better than, than D3. Sorry, the the black bars here represent the um, uh, performance of B3LIT BCP. I hope everyone can see that. Um, they, the key to uh, extract uh, a value from, from this plot is to uh, understand that calculations were performed on a very large set of uh, 66 non-covalently interacting dimers composed of hydrogen bond species, dispersion bound species, and uh, about, about 20 or so dimers uh, that are characterized as interacting through mixed uh, forces. And so uh, this histogram shows you the uh, occurrences as a function of percent error binding energy for each of the methods. And so you can see that the you can see from this plot that D3 led DCP has uh, its data clustered around around very nicely around zero. M062X uh, produces percent errors in binding that range from about minus 30 to 40 percent to about plus 20 percent. Um, and, and omega B97XD, yet another uh, dispersion corrected density functional theory method, uh, has errors uh, in, the, in the range of 0 to uh, 50 percent. So we're doing quite well. Next slide. Um, mo more recently, we've we've come to understand that DCPs can be used for more than just dispersion interactions. They can also be used to improve thermochemical properties. That, that means we're going to have to come up with a, a different name now, as the D in DCP stands for dispersion. Uh, and so, uh, well, I don't know if anyone has any ideas, feel free to email me 
Um, this plot, um, this bar chart shows you uh, the performance of, uh, this is another uh, density functional theory method that we've recently been looking at, LC omega. We chose to look at that for a number of reasons, but it turns out that we can design DCTs that improve the dispersion behavior of LC omega PVE, which is not easy, but also improve covalent uh, properties like bond dissociation. So for um, for a, a very large, and I can't remember, I think it's something like 50 or so different uh, uh, different uh, chemical species, where we've broken the indicated bonds, we've broken CO, CN, CC bonds, etc. We're able to re reproduce experimental um, bond dissociation energies using DCPs far better than uh, can be achieved using the D3 approach of GRIMA, which is really not designed for, for uh, improving thermochemical properties, but uh, and uh, offers a, a great improvement over the fair functionality with no corrections at all. And so we're pretty excited about this. We view this as a, as a huge success for the methodology in general, uh, and, and uh, completely enabled by our involvement with Western. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in terms of future efforts with DCPs, we, we have a few things that we'd still like to uh, get done with DCPs. Uh, we should be able to uh, we should be able to achieve those uh, this year, maybe next. We'd like to be able to develop a set of DCPs that could be used for so-called low-cost density functions. So I showed you the LC Omega PDE. It's a fairly expensive functionality in terms of computational time. Even D3 LIT uh, is expensive for a number of reasons. Uh, so we're thinking about how we can take very low cost uh, density function theory methods and improve them to a similar extent uh, through the use of we, We're also going to be targeting uh, improving uh, thermochemical, kinetic, and non-covalent interaction properties collectively. Um, we also uh, we also really need to develop a deeper understanding of, of how these uh, DCPs work. And to some extent, uh, the, the book of what I, I've shown you here uh, is, is fairly empirical. What we've done is we've taken these functions, we've optimized them to reproduce a certain behavior, but understanding uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a deep theoretical basis what's going on has so far eluded us and, and a lot of the, the rest of the theoretical computation. So, so we're working on that as well. In terms of challenges, uh, the challenges that we face in using Westgate facilities for this kind of work, um, as I as I see the, the 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 conventional allocation scheme associated with with Rex uh, is not ideally suited to the work, or what it is that we're trying to do isn't ideally suited to the way Grex is set up. So in, in, our, in our fitting procedures, we might need to run 100 Gaussian calculations to take one optimization step for a DCP. And we might need 100 optimizations to get accurate or, or good performance. Um, and each one of those Gaussian runs requires maybe only from between 20 seconds to an hour tops, depending on the, the type of basis that we use. So, um, so for those other jobs that are submitted to the queue, you might have to wait uh, five minutes or ten minutes for the job to enter the queue, only to run for 20 seconds uh, to extract the single number that we need. So, um, so there are some challenges there. I don't really have very many good ideas about how we could work around that, unless uh, unless the uh, allocation scheme or the run scheme has changed. Um, the other challenge that we have is the optimization scripts that we're using are very complicated and they're uh, very platform dependent. They they can only really be run on Rex, and uh, uh, part of the reason for this is, is the way the scripts were set up to run in the first place. It was sort of they started out as a very quick hack, and uh, for pro for programmers out there, I'm sure you know that when you start something as a hack. And you Building on it as I just it starts off looking pretty bad, it ends up looking like Frankenstein, and it becomes really intense. 
So, so those are the challenges. Uh, okay, and that brings me to my, my last slide. I think that that was on time. Uh, there are a number of uh, agencies that contributed to uh, the success that we've had uh, with, with our DCPs. Uh, not the least of which is uh, Center for Oil Sands uh, Innovation, which is now called, uh, well, the acronym is IOC, I can't quite remember what it stands for, but we, we've been supported uh, uh, for part of this work through, uh, through the Center for Oil Sands Innovation at the University of Alberta, supported by uh, also Imperial Oil and uh, Alberta University of Alberta. And of course, we can in West Bend. Uh, individuals involved, are one more quick. With Manuel Torres, who uh, was with me as uh, Mint as a research associate, uh, Ian Mackey, who uh, was part of the COSI project uh, as a postdoc uh, to the Department of Physics, and Professor Eric Johnson, who's now at the former student line, who's now at the University of California at the uh, Thank you for your attention, and I hope that we can get questions and discussion. Yep. Do you do you have a microphone to Sure, yeah, we'll we'll just we'll share. Okay. I'm no good at that. Okay. Um, I um, often use Gaussian to um, determine ch charges on ligands um, and then do RESP fitting. Like I, I run electron structure and then do RESP fitting and then feed this into an MD simulation. And I was wondering how important it is to include the Sandra's correction when I'm doing that charge fitting procedure. Uh, that's a good question. The, uh, most of the density functional theory methods will not modify uh, charges um, um, sorry let, let me start my answer again. So the, the uh, density functional theory methods uh, themselves or include, sorry, inclusion of dispersion corrections in the density functional methods won't alter the charges. What they do, though, is they alter the structure of non-covalently bound systems. And so um, you're, you may have uh, you may you may have two pieces of a structure that come very close together because of dispersion interactions, and that itself will redistribute the charges. And so you will not get that structure correct unless you include the dispersion interactions, and therefore you won't get the charges correct. Well, parts parts of a monomer, so the question was, is that just for a dimer, but parts of a monomer as well. So you can, you can think about a protein as being uh, a single molecule, uh, and the structure of that protein is going to be determined by partly by these dispersion interactions. And so to get the, the structure of a large molecule that's got blocky bits and pieces on it, Perhaps like a, uh, is it a transition metal system? Uh, yeah, I would say ligand structure. You, it, it's worth it's worth comparing at least uh, before going too far with your calculations. The structure of the ligand with and without dispersion. Well, you, you, you guys have it. Yeah, they can, they, sure, uh, anyone who wants the slides can send me an email directly. I'd be happy to send them off to you.
Oh, I have a question here for you from Yuvik. Um, so, I mean, uh, we have a lot of people that are now trying to push the boundaries of this density functional uh, theory stuff. And um, so basically they have either like, for example, a, a surface and then a molecule on top. And uh, to simulate those things, you usually require a big, you know, super cell and it takes forever and people are tweaking that and this and nobody knows what's going on. <laughs> So, uh, do you have any recommendation, especially with uh, Gaussian and things like that, for like, you know, whether it's cluster or whatever they are using under Gaussian to simulate these things? Um, well, without knowing the details of, of your system, I can tell you about my experience using Gaussian to model uh, organic molecules on silicon surfaces. So, I would choose, uh, I would, depending on what I was after, I would choose uh, a slab in such a way so that the area of the surface in the model uh, was of appropriate size to accommodate the, the molecule uh, that was uh, that these orbs in that surface. And, and that's usually, that for me, that was sufficient uh, for the silicon stuff. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that we weren't really after trying to reproduce any of the band structure associated with the silicon. Uh, it was perfectly fine. And, and in terms of understanding thermochemistry associated with surface reactions, um, uh, all of that, that, that uh, the energetics associated with that surface chemistry tend to be highly local. So you don't need to worry so much about uh, reproducing band structure in that case. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, can they take that? What? We'll go with the local question. Yeah. My question is uh, on top of the slide, which was the presentation for all of them. For the uh, for all of them, I saw that for hydrogen bonding, they are compact at the same point. Was that in study that about who or how did that? No, the um, uh, that wasn't predetermined in any way. It just it just turns out that for the small set of, of uh, hydrogen bonded systems that were included in in that uh, slightly larger set, uh, that most of the methods predicted the binding energy to within about five percent. As I said, that was a little it's a little bit misleading because if you look at a larger set like the S sixty six set, you start to see. Uh, you start to see larger percent errors. Uh, but the other thing that's somewhat masked by the percent error um, measure is that with some hydrogen bonds, you know, if you have a, a base pair, for example, the hydrogen bonding system is the 15 or 17 kcal per mole. And so a small, in that case, even a small percent error is a very large absolute error. So the percent error metric is, is not always it's a very dramatic plot. That's why I want to do a plot. But it's, it, it's a little bit, uh, it can be a little bit misleading depending on the system. Yep. We have a question here at UBCL. Hi. Um, so say you had a uh, metal cofactor, and you're looking at it in uh, with residues from an enzyme around it. Would you apply your DCP corrections only to the atoms for residues in close proximity to the metal there, or would you apply it to your whole system? And like, how, what, what would the computational expense be if you were to apply it only to residues close to the metal uh, or the whole system? The, uh, the nice thing about uh, DCPs, and, and in fact, uh, the same could be said for the, um, the Grima type D3 corrections, is that the computational cost is negligible. So uh, to answer your question, I would apply, uh, in either case, I would apply the corrections to the entire system. Um, you know, there, wh one, of the, one of the drawbacks associated with the D DCP approach is that you need to develop DCPs for each atom in the periodic table for generality, but, but in principle we can't really do that because we don't have all of the data that we need to optimize the DCPs. And so we often find ourselves in a situation 
where we're only applying PCTs to the atoms uh, for which uh, our library is populated. And so, uh, so for transition metal systems, we, we often have to neglect the transition metal. Uh, but for most purposes, that's not really uh, a big problem. Hey, Doug Phillips in Calgary, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Hi, Doug. Uh, I was wondering whether you had worked with any Westgrid technical staff on your scripting problem and the, the problem of uh, very short runs and having to wait and so on. Uh, 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 only to a very limited extent. So one of the issues that we had was when the, when the, uh, the operating system for Grex was recently upgraded, uh, the script stopped working properly. So we were digging in there trying to, by hook or by crook, get the, get the damn thing running again. It's so sensitive to the environment. Uh, and, then, and then I did have some, uh, a brief exchange with some uh, West Grade technical staff. Um, but if that's the sort of thing that, uh, that West Grade can help me with, I'd, I'd absolutely love to take advantage of it. I encourage you to pursue that because uh, it would be more more efficient for everybody if, if your scripts could be optimized. Yep, absolutely. Do you have a name? I'm not the one that would be best to help you with Gaussian-related issues, but uh, general-related uh, uh, scripting okay. issues, uh, just about anybody could help you with. Okay, great. So Masao put his hand up here, so I'll, I'll be tapping out for that. Thanks. <laughs> so we have a question here at SFU. Go ahead. Okay, just talk on the key. That's fine. Okay. Hi. I was wondering how uh, uh, large has to be the system when you use DCP. I mean, is there any limit on the number of atoms? No. No, there's no limit. It could be applied to any system, large or small, single atom or yeah, look, for example, I have a uh, small radical, let's say organic molecule, in a big cage. Like around it, maybe the cage is 200 atoms. Like it could be used in, in that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, um, if, you have, if you have more specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Feel free to send me an email. Yeah, that would be great if I could email you. Sure. Do you have my email address? Uh, actually, if I wrote it on the first slide... Uh, probably on the presentation. Or, right, so oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. We still didn't get U of C. Oh, did? Oh, that was Doug. Right, right. Sorry, Doug. Yeah, there's one more local question. In, in the data that you presented, it looked like your method was doing better than Grimm's D3 method, and I was wondering if there are any cases where that method does better. Um, in general, for non-covalent interactions, uh, we the TCP approach is it's one of the best uh, methods available. Uh, so the Grimm approach with, with uh, the B3 LYT functional, uh, I mean, it's okay. It's a, you know, I don't mean to suggest that it's that it's bad. Uh, but in terms of mean absolute error, uh, the DCP approach is is uh, performing about a factor of two better. Something something like that. At least at least for some of the metrics that we have, like the like the S sixty six set, one of these large sets of, of non covalent bond uh, molecules, uh, and that particular functionality. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, the Grimma correction seems to work best with a particular functionnel, something called PW86 PDE, which isn't exactly uh, commonly used. Um, but I don't know how that particular functionnel performs for things like thermochemistry or, or other properties that you may also be interested in. That's it for questions. Did you want one, one more local one? 
as you have many data, uh, uh, sorry, as you have many data right now on the parameter you run for the DCP model you're working with, have you seen any trend for the specific atoms, for example, of any hydrogen atom connected to oxygen has some average number for the parameter of the DCP, or it's totally different? Because I'm really interested in systems that I think I cannot find the binding energy, so the optimization doesn't work. So if I can transfer the parameter to have for some other system to measure the book, that would be. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, it, 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 there, there are some uh, broad patterns uh, that, that we've observed in, in the, over the last couple of years with respect to optimization of DCP parameters to the one that we're doing on that. Uh, density functional theory methods that are uh, that, that have certain relationships with each other uh, tend to have DCPs that are more easily transferable between each other. So that, that could be one approach that uh, also, we tend to see that um, a certain structure for DCP is required for the carbon atom. Uh, carbon atoms need to be made more attractive, and so the coefficients associated with carbon DCPs are negative uh, to create attractive potentials, that sort of thing. So, so those sorts of broad trends we've observed. But, uh, that's a very good point. And if there's a particular system that you're interested in, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I think that's it. Okay, well thank you. Thank you all for coming here today and for joining the book. Thanks guys.